Alright boys, how's it going? Hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm making this video to document my design process for a university project that I'm currently working on. We're six to seven weeks into the design now, so I'll go in chronological order uh, and briefly summarize each week what we dealt with and how the design evolved. So, yeah. So this is what we had for the first week. It has changed a lot since then. But basically, we are repurposing a con mill, putting a steel frame shell over it to protect the existing building, which is colored in red. Sort of like the Hill House box by Comedy Groik. We looked at their structure and also the convention hall by Miss Van der Rohe for inspiration. We're having indoor... Hello guys, I'm editing the video at the moment and I realize I missed some information out regarding the site context, so I'll talk about it now. The project is located in a town called Dalmana, which is a 20 minute walk east from the city center of Glasgow in Scotland. The town was a powerhouse back in the industrial era with uh, manufacturing plants, cotton mills and steel mills. It's a working class neighborhood with tons of activity. After the industrial decline, the population dropped from 50,000 to 5,000 within a few years. At the moment, the unemployed population is quite high and the community spirit is rather low. The neighborhood at the moment consists mainly of residential flats, a velodrome built for the Commonwealth Games, a police station towards the west, and a wastewater treatment plant towards the south, and commercial auto shops scattered about. There's tons of brownfields and literally no essential shops, retail, restaurants, cafes, public spaces, social spaces, nothing. We had a draft master plan during the first week of the design process. Basically, we proposed to have a waterfront development by the river, introducing culture buildings, commercial offices, essential shops, restaurants, retail. The yellow highlighted block is where the cotton mill is located. The concept is to repurpose it and protect it and make it the main feature of the master plan. Also using this place as a food production zone in regards to aeropoint farming, rekindling the manufacturing spirit of the area by giving it a new purpose and you know feeding the people and leading the way in urban farming. The master plan is still being worked on and we'll talk about it more when we refine it later on. Now let's go back to the design proposal. We're having indoor urban aeroponic farming, botanical gardens, market halls for the public, associated spaces for business operation. The market hall is located in the big central hangar, botanical gardens on the east and west. The north and south compartments we labeled A and B because we didn't know what to do with them at that time. We used the towers of the existing building located on the sides for vertical circulation and upper floor access. We didn't know what kind of spaces that we had to include in this building because it is kind of an odd typology. So we still have to do more research on that. We wanted to create an interactive farmhouse kind of building because this is gonna be the focal point of the town. We wanted this place to be a food production zone but still have spaces for community interaction and congregation. So we looked to the market hall by MVRDB for inspiration. This is located in Rotterdam. It's actually a residential building with a hollow void that houses the market hall in the middle. They have these stalls scattered about and have rooftop seating for socializing and chilling. Uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, I've never seen a typology crossover like this. It's right in the city center as well. So it's good to know that we have a you know built, realized precedent that we can look up to, that we can learn from. So we went ahead and designed our own stall made of timber. This is a very early draft sketch of what the stall would look like. We have the kitchen in a center core with the counters on the perimeter and a block on the side that has storage, toilets, and a spiral staircase that takes you up to the roof deck seating. Now, to bring that back to the urban farming concept, what you see here is the idea we had of what the interior market hall space would look like. You picture yourself sitting right under the farm that grew the crops that you're eating on your plate right at that very moment. The market stall is selling the produce that's grown in-house, and yeah, I thought it'd be a cool experience, a unique experience for the place, and yeah, I don't want to get into urban farming too much because it's not my area of expertise. But basically, it's a modern way of farming which makes the most efficient use of space by stacking the, you know, planting space uh, uh, vertically above each other. And everything else is controlled, you know, the inputs, the, uh, the light, the water, the nutrients. So it's a very efficient way of farming. A per acre, it produces 350% more crops and uses 90% less water than conventional farming. There's actually no water wastage at all because 10% uh, of that is absorbed by the plants. They also don't use soil. They use like some sort of medium or like sometimes they just let the roots dangle in the air and like some, they supply the nutrients through a mist 
uh, which is what aeroponics is. Uh, so the crops grow fast and healthy because they get the right amount of nutrients, right amount of water. There's no pest problems because you know it's uh, grown in a controlled environment. There's no soil. Aero Farms is one of the biggest urban farming company in the world, and they have multiple facilities all over the U.S. And our vertical hanging farm shelving design is based on theirs. From this image, you can see we're thinking of suspending them off the steel truss structure. They will cover the entire mill building, which is colored in red. We have the market hall in the center void and the botanical gardens on the sides. So it would make sense to place a garden in the design because uh, in Glasgow, where this uh, design is located, the People's Palace has just been closed. So we kind of need a new like uh, botanical garden feature. So moving on to week two, uh, we were asked to do a mini interior design exercise. Uh, part of this project, uh, we were told to choose a space within the design to, you know, uh, showcase what it feels like, what the materials are, what the furnishings are, uh, what the activities are. So I chose to show the market stalls in the main hall. This is a quick elevation view of the market stalls sitting above water. Trading would be on the perimeter with a kitchen in the center. Up top we have the roof deck seating. Behind it you can see the red brick wall of the existing cotton mill building overshadowed by the newly inserted steel frame structure used to support the wall and also upper level platform circulation. And beyond that you can see the trees from the botanical garden through the voids of the window openings of the existing building. This section view gives an idea of the timber structure of the stall and the play on timber joinery shown through the cabinetry storage and furniture which are all bespoke designs. The column to beam joint is pretty straightforward. We have the double beams that will sit on top of each other, tongue and groove style and secured into position with pegs. This is a design of the chairs for the roof that cafe. The top plate will slide into the bottom plate. The connection is cut in a triangular shape to avoid the top lifting up. Then they rest on top of the main beam which then connects to two other supports on the side which is then secured with the legs with wooden pegs. Um, not very experienced with the uh, timber joinery. My knowledge on it is pretty limited, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool and wanted to try it. This is a rough render of the stall. We have the water underneath and the brick wall behind with the shadows of the steel structure cast over it. One thing we had to consider was the structure of the roof deck because right now it is left exposed as we have the beams, the joists and the timber decking just stacked on top of each other. But if we're gonna have a cafe up top, it's not really practical because um, think like if someone just spilled like hot coffee and like dripped through the cracks and down to the kitchen, it's not really safe, right? It's not really practical. Now move on to the third week. Uh, I had to look up a buildings with a similar typology to what I was designing because I never really, I never designed something like this at all. It was kind of weird uh, typology anyways. It's not the usual uh, residential, cultural, commercial kind of building. It's not one, but like a combination of few different things. But I found this company called Unilever and they are basically food innovators, which is similar to what my building is. They make healthy versions of food such as ketchup with less sugar. They have huge campuses in many countries. One of them is in the Netherlands that's about 18,000 square meters, which has a similar building footprint to ours. They have laboratories, test kitchens, office for business operations, factory, meeting rooms. So our building program is based off what they have. We thought of having the offices, meeting rooms and multi-purpose halls on the north side of the building and a factory on the south which handles the logistics, processing and storing the crops and a loading zone dedicated for deliveries and all that stuff. We also had the idea of suspending pavilions of the steel frame structure that can be used as laboratories kitchen workshops and control points for the farm. I didn't think it was possible to do, uh, you know, suspending like very heavy stuff off uh, truss. But then I saw this tea house design by David Jameson, which was pretty cool. Although this is a frame structure and ours is a truss. And as we know, they take loads differently. We didn't want to go with a frame structure because we wanted a big open space. Uh, I've asked like uh, people with some civil engineering knowledge and it is possible to do, but you have to hang them off the nodes, the pin joints of the trusses apparently. The idea was that the suspended vertical gardens would be automated and move according to their growing cycle and they would self-rotate on the shelves. So we have the preparation and incubation room at the top in the suspended pavilions and the seed trays would be sent out to the aeroponic shelving units. Now this building is meant to be a paradigm of the future way of living so we wanted this building to be as environmentally friendly as possible. And as we know the built environment contributes about 40% of the UK's uh, total carbon footprint. 
this comes from materials and how they're produced, building maintenance and energy consumption and, you know, logistics and so on. And obviously with the environment going to hell at the moment, uh, we wanted to design something that is that adheres to the UK government's um, net zero target. One of the most used methods is uh, using solar panels to harness uh, energy from sun. We used a heating demand calculator that was given to us by the university back in third year to do like a passive house project. This calculator takes into account the area of the facades, the ventilation losses, U values, and shows on the graph the time in the year where we had to uh, heat the building mechanically. So the Heating demand for the design is approximately 400k uh, kilowatts per year. There's enough space on the roof of the building to generate 1 million kilowatts per year of electricity uh, using the 250 watt uh, solar panels. So theoretically, we could heat the entire building using solar energy for an entire year and still have like plenty left over that we can store in batteries that we can use in a future date or you know supply it to the wider neighborhood and at this point we still didn't know what to do with the building facade we know we wanted to conceal it rather than have it permeable because of practicality For urban farming you have to have full control of the environment the humidity the temperature so yeah just everything you have to have control of uh and also this building will be used by the employees and the member of the public for an extended period of time as we know in scotland you know it's pretty cold and it rains a lot so Concealing it makes sense. Initially, we were going for a fully glazed facade with translucent insulation inspired by the Nelson Atkins Museum by Stephen Hall. So looking from the outside, you can sort of make out the red brick from the cotton mill and the silhouettes of the trees from the botanical gardens. But this will be very energy intensive. There's gonna be a lot of heat loss and heat gain and the building footprint is about 120 by 70 meters and 30 meter high. So that's a lot of glass and you know, that's quite expensive as well. So we thought of uh, having metal decking on the top portion of the facade and having like slits where you know the glaze would go up to the top but then it ended up like barcodes so that didn't work. Um, now we move on to week four. Uh, one of the things that was brought up was the accessibility of the roof deck seating of the stalls. Going back to the plan that we had for the first week, all the stalls were placed in the middle, in the water, and the circulation is on the outer side. We didn't want to place a lift in each stall because it would cost quite a bit of money. At this stage in our architecture education, in our final year, the design budget is something that we were told to uh, actively think about. We also didn't want bridges going all over the place because we already have um, suspended gardens and pavilions off the roof and we wanted to keep the bottom few levels a bit open. So the plan was to move the stalls to the sides where it's closer to the upper floor circulation, which are placed next to the existing wall. We also felt like changing the rigid linear layout of the stalls to make it a more interesting experience. I remember when I went to Kaido, I went to this place called Ningo Terrace, and basically it is a shopping gallery in the middle of the forest. It was a pretty cool experience because like the these cabins were like scattered about and you walk on these uh, wooden platforms that uh and like slowly explore the entire place and like each bend each turn was pretty exciting because like you can't clearly see uh you don't have a clear picture of what's ahead so we tried to emulate it uh but i did this late in the night right before the day of the tutorial i was running behind schedule but the plan kind of works but it's a nice idea and my tutor agreed as well so I was told to run with it and yeah, just like keep refining it. Now for the structure, we changed it completely. We decided to go with glue them instead of steel because it is more environmentally friendly. And that made me rethink the entire structure of the building. In my mind, trusses are always drawn in triangles because like that's how the load is distributed. And then we also have like to have cross bracing on the sides for the horizontal loads. So there's more triangles there. So I was just like triangles in my mind for the entire week. So I was thinking what we, what if we had the entire structure and the facade triangular. So I tried to recall uh, the time where I went to Singapore. I took some pictures of the Jewel Airport. They had this triangular grid system and I think it's part of the structure. I thought it was pretty cool. It was pretty elegant kind of design. I also looked through the photos of the Milan Expo when I went there in 2015. Uh, the Chile Pavilion was pretty cool. They had this timber, like triangular truss kind of structure systems. Um, so yeah, I tried to emulate that, but I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the different geometries. I don't think they worked very well. So the idea was discarded and yeah. Now week five, wait, week five. 
This week we looked into piezoelectric facade, basically as a technology where you harness the wind uh, movement and converts the uh, mechanical energy into electric energy using uh, piezo uh, elements, piezo crystals such as quartz and amethyst. Now I'm not an engineer, I'm not a wind specialist, this is totally out of my depth, but I had to do some research and find out how it works because I want to design something that moves from my facade and there's not much material that I can find that's built so I kind of need to know the fundamentals of how it worked from my research, do not quote me on this. Um, what I learned is that these piezo crystals are made of uh, symmetrical cell structure. When they're disbalanced by movement, they try to rebalance themselves to get back to equilibrium. In that process, they produce uh, electric energy. So yeah, that's the extent of my knowledge on piezo electricity. There's some conceptual designs incorporating this uh, technology such as the OLED turbine. The blades are connected to a central hollow column that has cables inside which is connected to a generator at the bottom that converts mechanical energy into electric energy. Same goes for the design of the windstock, which oscillates in the wind and also has cables in them that connects to a generator at the base. This led me to look into vertical axis wind turbines because I wanted to know how they work before I designed something. I found out it's a very ancient technology that dates back to the Persians in Iran about 500 to 900 AD. Theirs is made of mud, wood and clay and they used it to grind grains. The classic models are the Darius and the Savonius turbine. The Darius model can't self-start but is 20% more efficient than the Savonius due to its torque but the Savonius can self-start. So a combination of both would be good but the vertical axis wind turbine sector is very underdeveloped and so we were kind of left to our own devices to design something. So we looked at building facades that symbolize movement like the Sydney Opera House and the Lotus Temple in India. So this led us to flowers and the shapes of the petals. For some reason, we use the lotus as reference because in Buddhism, it symbolizes purity of mind, speech, and soul. And it also represents hope and perseverance. So we thought that our, those are qualities that we thought the building and the surrounding context needed since it's an area that's been destroyed. The sky's the limit with technology, so we thought we would go big or go home. And this is what we came up with. The idea is to treat the building as one big wind turbine and have the facade constantly rotating. We would have an exterior cladding and after that a layer of blades which are hung and attached to the gearbox which would then rotate the retractable hydraulic arms around the building because the shape does not have an equal radius. This is then connected to a center column which connects to a generator at the bottom. This was inspired by the Fosun Foundation building in Shanghai with a rotating bamboo curtain. However, uh, my tutor wasn't really feeling it so the design was scrapped. We cleaned up the structure and went with a rectilinear arrangement with simple sleek cross bracing. Still using glue line for everything. The columns are placed 10 meter apart and the trusses are 5 meter apart. A significant reduction since the first week with the thick steel members. So we were inspired by the Tamedia office building by Shigeru Ban in Zurich that utilizes timber joinery for the structure. The entire structure is made of glue lamb with a glazed exterior facade. So we tried to emulate that with our own structure, design our own timber column with undulations on the surface and the beams would go right through it. The smaller column member would have a cross pattern at where the beams join it together. It connects to the main column at the bottom, which then connects to a steel plate and to the concrete block. Still needs improvement though, still needs better detailing, but that's sort of the vibe. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool to, you know, incorporate timber joinery and to express the structure of the design. Um, so we clean up the plan that we had from last week. Uh, we have most of the stalls on the sides now for accessibility. We think it's a significant improvement from the rigid linear layout. So yeah, that basically sums up the past few weeks of the design process. I've got to get cracking and prepare for the next tutorial because it's in three, two and a half days now and I haven't done anything for it, so which is uh, slightly worrying. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go and do that. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, I'll see you guys in the next video. And uh, yeah.